The war in Ukraine shows little sign of ending, with continued destruction and losses on both sides. Sanctions against Russia continue, but its economy is growing. And in the US, political support for Ukraine's war effort is under pressure. So what could happen in 2024? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Puranum. Although Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky denies it, many observers believe the war in Ukraine is at a stalemate. Despite much foreign financial and military aid and managing to hold Russian forces back, Ukraine's efforts on the battlefield have won little ground recently. Bipartisan support for Ukraine in the U.S. has disintegrated, threatening funding with uncertainty too posed by next year's U.S. presidential election. For Russia, there have been high military casualties, but it seems to have weathered much of the economic damage from wide-ranging sanctions. So what could happen militarily and politically in 2024? And will it be a decisive year in the war? We'll be asking these questions and more of our guests shortly. But first, Victoria Gatenby looks at how the war's momentum shifted over the past year. This time last year, hopes were high in Ukraine that its military could press home the advantage it had gained that autumn and push Russian forces out of much of the territory they'd seized since 2022. That hasn't happened, and the front line has barely moved. Now Kyiv is increasingly worried about the future of Western aid for its war effort. Ukraine has had a very, very difficult year, and it's been made more difficult uh, by debates that have been happening in the United States and Europe about how the West can continue to send it financial aid and military aid going forward. Russian President Vladimir Putin also faced setbacks. The International Criminal Court indicted him for war crimes committed against Ukrainian children. That made it impossible for him to travel to many countries. Then he faced the biggest challenge to his authority in his more than two decades in power, a mutiny by the Wagner mercenary group. It backfired, Putin diffused the revolt and reasserted his hold on the Kremlin. Wagner chief and mutiny leader Yevgeny Prigozhin was killed in a plane crash months later. Militarily, Putin got a victory he wanted in the fight for the bombed-out city of Bakhmut. Analysts say Western sanctions are damaging but not crippling the Russian economy. The domestic front is looking pretty good for Putin. He's managed to portray the war as a fight Russia against the West, and the Russian public is buying it, and they are willing to sacrifice human lives and um, also economically, so that the, much of the economy is directed toward the war. Putin is playing a waiting game, calculating that Western powers will be fractured by political divisions and eroded by war fatigue, and their support for Ukraine will crumble. But analysts say NATO is committed to supporting Ukraine, and the war will likely drag on throughout 2024. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests. In Moscow is Pavel Felgenhauer, a Russian military and defense analyst. In Rome, Michael Bosukiu, a global affairs analyst and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. And in Dublin is Chris Weifer, chief executive officer of Macro Advisory, that's a strategic consultancy with a focus on Russia and the Eurasia region. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Felgenhauer, let me start with you in Moscow. Russia seems to be outspending, outmanning, outgunning Ukraine. Just how strong is the Russian position entering 2024? Well, the Russian position, yes, it's strong. And of course, Russia is a much bigger country uh, with more population, a much more robust uh, industry and defense industry. And uh, also it has lots of oil and natural gas and other uh, resources that can be sold on the world market, which Ukraine doesn't, has few. So, I mean... Uh, Ukraine versus Russia, well, that's a foregone conclusion. But of course, Ukraine has allies in the West and the other industrial nations. 
of a so-called Ramstein group of about 50 nations, which have uh, in, together about, well, maybe 100 times more GDP than Russia does. Uh, but of course, their commitment is not total. So as a result, there's a kind of st uh, stalemate, a bloody stalemate on the battlefield, a bloody stalemate in all respects of this conflict, uh, where neither side has a decisive superiority. Yeah, absolutely. So a standstill and second year standstill along most of the front lines, despite major fighting, high casualty rates. In the military ranks, Mr. Uh, Bosirku, let me bring you in here. In the military ranks, there certainly seems to be a growing opposition in Ukraine for post-Soviet management styles within the senior leadership. Is Ukraine at its most perilous position since the Russian invasion nearly two years ago? Um, I wouldn't say that. I think uh, Ukraine has a lot in its arsenal, in its back pocket that it hasn't deployed yet. And for example, uh, it is getting those HIMARS missiles from the United States. Uh, the more powerful ones, the ones with longer range. And I'm told that um, some of them may be cap capable, actually, of not only poking a hole in that Kerch Strait Bridge, which is Mr. Putin's pet project, but also a vital military supply line for Russia, but it could obliterate it completely. So I think we've yet to see that real firepower being used. Um, the other kind of wild card here is that um, even though there's something like uh, 61 billion um, on the line from the United States to provide to Ukraine with more aid and 50 billion from here in Europe, uh, hopefully that will come through for Ukraine. But if it doesn't, the other wild card is the 300 billion or so in fro frozen Russian assets in Western countries, Canada, US, uh, Belgium, places like that. So if the Western allies were to get their act together and be able to um, unfreeze that and get it Ukraine's way, I yeah. think that could really put Ukraine over the top in terms of being able to strike back even more with more advanced weaponry. Chris Weifer in, in Dublin, that's a very big wild card, isn't it? Using frozen Russian assets in Western nations against Russia. Sure. How likely is that? Well, uh, we hear that the officials in Brussels and, and Washington, of course, are talking more about it. They're pushing for it. They, they want it. But it's against uh, still opposition or against the advice uh, from, from the legal community and from the ECB in particular, who are, are concerned that any such move against sovereign assets, uh, central bank assets, would lead to, you know, kind of uh, prolonged legal claims uh, against the EU, in particular where most of the money is now frozen, and in particular could undermine confidence in the uh, the euro and in the Europe, uh, the eurozone financial community. And remember, uh, this comes at a time when tomorrow the the BRICS community. In which China, Russia, of course, are very dominant, but that expands with the inclusion of countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So freezing, uh, ECB is, officials have already said that freezing, uh, or sorry, looking to confiscate and use Russian sovereign assets could lead to a backlash uh, against Europe by the broader uh, BRICS community. So it's a political ambition but it comes against a lot of caution, a lot of concern by those in the ECB and in the legal community. Yeah, that remains a big if. Something we have seen is sanctions over nearly the last two years. And as we've mentioned, despite those sanctions, the Russian economy shows, the figures from the Russian economy, that it's grown. Mr. Felgenhauer, just how effective, how much of an impact have these sanctions had? Russia has found incredible ways of circumventing them, hasn't it? Well, the, what has been done to try to circumvent um, the sanctions, sometimes that's more successful, sometimes not. Uh, the Russian GDP this year, yes, it has grown, uh, but in a wartime situation, that's well rather normal because this war, it's a kind of industrial war, a classical 20th century industrial war. That means there's increased uh, budgetary spending, increased uh, military production. That, grow, th that way, the GDP, yes, in percentage points, it will grow, but that does not mean that everything in Russia is very fine and ticking. It's not uh, that 
it's not that at all. They're, they're serious problems. Russia does have problems. Of course, Ukraine has lots of problems. I mean, that's why they what have would you, a, Mr. Falkenhauer, what would you say the biggest problems are? Both sides have problems. What would you say the biggest problems and challenging facing challenges facing Russia are? Uh, well, the Russian uh, production of modern weapons, though there's been a lot of talk that it's increased and it has increased, but from a very low start. So there's not enough uh, really modern weapons. There are problems in producing modern drones, modern planes, modern tanks. And uh, say there's a very serious problem with civil aviation. Uh, Putin says there's going to be t uh, 1,000 new civil aviation uh, planes by the year 2030. But that seems rather far-fetched. And Russia is a very, very big country with rather bad roads. Without civil aviation, the country will maybe actually begin to disintegrate, possibly. At least there are going to be very serious problems. And everyone knows that. So there's a lot, really, for that Russia would need to make better. And that's why, really, trying to get some kind of a ceasefire mm -hmm. right now, I mean, to stabilize the situation as it is, would be seen most likely in Moscow as advantageous. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Michael Bosicki, one of the challenges for Ukraine that really struck out to me is that, you know, the West is urging Ukraine to keep going with its war effort. But the average age I was reading for the Ukrainian armed forces is 43. It's 35 by comparison for Russia. I mean, wars are fought by the young. Are they not? Does the fact that Ukraine soldiers are all, almost middle-aged men, what does that mean for its manpower? Yeah, well, I think the biggest problem is that the men and women on the front lines have spent way too much time without a break. So we are seeing the emergence of protests in Kiev and other cities of mothers and wives and sons and daughters are really lobbying the Ukrainian government to put time limits on how much time the, the troops spend at the front line. So that's why we're now hearing um, news of a possible mass mobilization, 500,000 plus of Ukrainians, uh, which will give those other guys a, a break at the front line. We'll see if that happens, but uh, it does indicate that uh, Ukraine has to kind of change its mix of people who are fighting. Of course, the other thing that's happening, as you well know, are the barrage of drones and missiles that uh, Mr. Putin is sending over, including the one just a few days ago and uh, just overnight in the past 24 hours to Kharkiv. Um, I think that indicates that all is not well on the Russian side of the front line, that Mr. Putin is resorting to a very cowardly way of fighting by sending missiles and drones to the ways of maternity hospitals, schools, churches, um, anyone who does that, you know, it's tough to call them a strong dictator. I think you have to call them a coward. So Ukraine knows that. And I think there's a limited supply of how many missiles they can send over. It's very expensive. And one more thing, if I may, a uh, kind of wild card as well. Iran is a big backer of Russia in terms of supplying drones. But, you know, they're also, uh, as you know, um, backing Hezbollah and Hamas and Gaza. And uh, a lot of uh, thinking now is that uh, they will be facing much more, not even not just sanctions, but strikes uh, as well to limit their capabilities. Well, of course, there has been a lot of attention on Israel's war on Gaza. Mr. Felgenhauer, let me bring you in here. How does Moscow feel? Could Moscow uh, gain from the attention that has been on Israel's war on Gaza? Has it meant that there's less attention on what Russia's doing in Ukraine? Well, maybe there was some hope that that would be the case, but it doesn't seem that it is, well, fully playing out for many European countries. Uh, the Rus the Ukrainian-Russian conflict is much closer to home than the one in the Middle East. Uh, so two conflicts at the same time doesn't mean that each conflict are going to benefit or some are going to benefit from the other. Uh, I don't see right now much changing, though there's hope that, yes, in the West, there's going to be a change of heart. 
And basically, there's hope that the Western governments will begin applying pressure on Kiev to find some kind of a ceasefire situation, a freezing of the present status quo, more or less. I mean, it's called the kind of the Korea uh, uh, decision, what happened in the Korean War when there was a bloody stalemate that ended in a truce on the line of control. And of course, the Iran-Iraq War of the 80s, also an industrial war, ended in a, tr in a truce eventually. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. The First World War also was a bloody stalemate, but it ended with one of the sides collapsing. So it's either that, a ceasefire on the lines as it is right now, in the coming maybe months or a coming year, or maybe suddenly one of the sides is going to collapse. Mr. Weaver, do you see, what do you think of, of what Mr. Falkenhauer is saying? Do you see Western countries putting any pressure on Ukraine to accept some kind of a ceasefire? Do you see them using more economic sanctions, more economic tools at their disposal in 2024, especially given how their sanctions have been circumvented? Well, I mean, obviously, we can just uh, comment on on what we hear uh, from from the U.S. and from Europe, uh, where on the one hand, it's clear there is difficulty in the White House and the EC Commission getting more financial support uh, for Ukraine. But on the other hand, all politicians uh, are equally clear in their continuing support for Ukraine in, in this conflict. Uh, clearly, this is going to be a bigger issue. Uh, this uh, coming into 2024, we have the US election, of course, the major one, November. There will be also likely parliamentary elections in the United Kingdom, uh, of course, which is a big backer of Ukraine and other elections as well around the world. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's something we are going to see debated uh, more and more. But I would expect we will see more sanctions. Uh, we've already heard from Brussels that there is some preparatory work being done for the 12th and even the 13th round uh, of sanctions. But it is becoming more difficult for the EU, the EC, to get consensus. We saw how long it took to get approval for uh, sanctions that were just announced in the, in the most recent package, the 11th package, uh, because of objections from, say, Brussels against the diamond sanctions, the Hungary against uh, uranium sanctions, etc. So it's, it's becoming a lot more difficult. Um, let me just say, though, it, you know, obviously just commenting on the year we've just had, as you said, the Russian economy has performed much better on almost all fronts. Uh, GDP is likely to be somewhere between three and three and a half percent. The trade current account surpluses are rising towards the end of the year. So a big improvement, particularly in the second half of the year when oil income uh, uh, rose. Now, as Russia goes into 2024, it is facing more headwinds. Um, first of all, of course, the, the, on the comparative basis, uh, year on year, uh, the growth numbers won't look as good, uh, 24 against 23. Um, but also the oil price is a lot lower globally. The price of Brent is a lot lower because of concern over the Chinese economy, etc., which will limit Russia's income. Uh, and also we're starting to see some of the more difficult aspects on financial sector sanctions in particular. It means, for example, India is finding it difficult to pay Russia for the oil that it's importing. It wants to pay, but of course, rupees are, are controlled and, mm -hmm. and therefore we're aware that this money is not coming up to Russia as quick. So 2024 uh, won't be a disaster or it won't be kind of a, a like a down year for Russia, but it will be a more difficult year than we've had in 2023. There are more headwinds building for sure because of the accumulation, the sheer volume of sanctions in place. And Mr. Bosaku, what about 2024 politically, the prospects for Ukraine, given the elections that Mr. Weifer mentioned, the US presidential mm. election, uh, the UK elections, European Parliament elections? Yeah. As, sure. Is Ukraine well, worried all, about the I prospect can... of a Trump presidency? Sure. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But if I can just throw in a couple more figures, I mean, with very, very limited resources, Ukraine has been able to destroy about 20 percent of the Russian Black Fleet. 
And according to Atlantic Council figures, about 50% of Russian conventional military capability. So if you're talking about headwinds in 2024 for Russia, that's going to add to it. I think, um, yeah, uh, absolutely, the U.S. election especially is going to be a really, really big factor in terms of what happens between Ukraine and Russia. I think Mr. Putin is trying to run down the clock, keep the war going until the election, hoping that Trump or MAGA Republican will get in. And then in the first few days of the administration, cut a deal that won't be in Ukraine's favor. So a lot of concern in Kyiv uh, about that, uh, where the election will go. And hence, that's why there's an urgency right now to get that uh, uh, 61 billion or so in funding released. But, um, uh, you know, I, I've just traveled to many, many countries around the world and I still feel that among the electorate, the support for supporting Ukraine is high. Just quickly, the reason why being that a lot of people are beginning to realize that we're so interconnected these days that if Russia decides to further weaponize food, uh, energy, migration, this will have immediate, almost immediate ramifications for electorate, uh, electorates around the world. But despite that support that you're speaking about, we haven't seen the US Congress approve that $61 billion um, in aid to Ukraine. Mr. Falkenhauer, what's the view in Moscow looking ahead to these elections in the US, in the UK, in the European Parliament? What's Russia hoping for? Well, there is some hope, but not that very much. It's understood that in the year uh, uh, soon, rather, in in January, uh, the American uh, in 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 the Beltway in Washington, they'll figure out their internal problems, and uh, aid to Ukraine is going to be in the pipeline, and uh, aid is going to come from European nations. Uh, so no one is putting that much hopes that there's going to be an immediate change of heart, but there is hope that the uh, gr grew the continued. Uh, bloodshed, the continued war, uh, uh, unending, uh, uh, unresolvable conflict will bring a change of heart in the West. That is the, but that's more of a long-term uh, uh, probability. And there is some hope on that, but not immediately. And Mr. Bosoku, what will it take, again, heading into 2024, what do you think it will take, we've spoken about many of the challenges, for Ukraine to not lose this war? Well, um, Ukraine is making some right moves. Uh, for example, they've tripled uh, defense production within Ukraine. They've managed to clamp down on um, corrupt actors uh, who have ripped off the army and other parts of the government. This is a very, very bad signal for the West to see. And um, I think the other thing that has to happen in Washington is they, the White House and the State Department have to get over this inexplicable um, mindset where if uh, Russia implodes because of uh, the war in Ukraine and other factors, other headwinds, that uh, this is actually not a bad thing. But there's a mindset that that can't be allowed to happen. And the other one, I still think in many capitals around the world, including in, in Washington, uh, Mr. Putin is still, uh, threat, his threats of nuclear, um, tactical nuclear weapons and that sort of thing is still making uh, decision makers over there nervous. So they have to get over these uh, this mindset. And I think that will further allow Ukraine to strike, for example, deeper inside um, inside Russia and, and, and especially legitimate military targets. Uh, those have to be taken care of as well. Mr. Weifel, do you what do you think the chances are of Russia imploding? How much of a hindrance do you think the West has, the West has been in Ukraine's, uh, in Ukraine, in support of Ukraine, rather? Well, um, there is no evidence uh, right now that, that uh, there is any danger of Russia imploding. Uh, the, the country is, is currently very stable. Uh, certainly, we can talk about the, the headwinds, as we mentioned earlier, and the problems in the economy and areas such as deteriorating demographics, all of which uh, will become a serious problems for the government to deal with over the next several years. 
uh, pr provided the current situation remains. But otherwise, you know, the country is is stable. Uh, the, the the evidence that I can see on the street, I mean, if we even disregard opinion polls, but just talking to people and traveling around the country, um, I don't see any evidence that people are, you know, pushing back against the government. They're, they're one cons the economy is, is, is relatively stable. Real incomes are growing up. Unemployment is only about three and a half percent, which actually isn't good, but at least you know, it means that there you know, it, it adds to stability. The, the one area of concern, of course, is whether or not there would be another round of mobilization. This is the, I think, the number one concern for for people in in the country. And, and the government, of course, keeps denying that they have any plans or that it's likely to happen. But if we don't have mobilization, then and the economy remains more or less as it is, even with the decline next year, as I said, then I don't see any reason whatsoever to assume that the country is facing any risk. Uh, of of breakup or of, of of instability. There's just simply no evidence of that uh, uh, visible at, at the moment. Mr. Falkenhauer, who do you see having the upper hand in 2024? Uh, well, as I say, this is a stalemate, and that means the most logical uh, way to deal with the stalemate is to find a way to freeze the situation and the fighting and have a uh, uh, organized ceasefire line of control like in Kashmir and uh, like in Korea, like in Cyprus and many other places. That was done. That can be done. That that seems the most logical way to get out of this situation, which is bad basically for everyone. Uh, but will that happen? That's another question. Right now, there doesn't seem to be the political will. Uh, China tried in this uh, year... In 23 to make some kind of move as a and they most likely are the best equipped to put some pressure on all sides to get some kind of solution some kind of freezing of the situation they failed all the others are not even close uh, so that's could that seems logical but that doesn't right. seem right now imminently happening we have less than a minute left and i'd like to ask uh, mr bosiku do you see russia holding on to the territory it's occupied in Ukraine or anything changing in 2024? Well, let's let's uh, remember that uh, this war actually started in 2014 when the little green men came in and when Russia illegally annexed uh, Crimea. So uh, those those parts are still in contention, if you will. But I think Ukraine will try very, very hard to sever that land bridge between mainland Russia and Crimea. One more quick thing. I know we only have a few seconds, but I also would like to see NATO grow a bit of spine and stand up more to Russia. The fact that a Russian missile the other day was able to spend three minutes in Polish airspace unchallenged. Imagine if that had happened in China, if a hostile missile had entered Chinese airspace for that amount yeah. of time. Imagine what their reaction would be. Yeah. NATO has to that's show them that this is not tolerable. Of course, and NATO and European <laughs> Union membership is a whole other issue that we will yeah. have to save for another episode. But thank you to all of our guests for this episode. It is Pavel Felgenhauer, Michael Bosirk, and Chris Weefer. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here, bye for now.